Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum. Uh, our guest in this segment is Chris Cook. Chris is the host of Guerrilla Radio on CFUV uh, and definitely one of the best radio interviewers in North America, I'd say. Um, and he also is the editor-in-chief of PacificFreePress.com, which is a site well worth going to. Uh, Chris, we're going to talk about some local, national, and international issues, and you want to talk, start with something that's going on at the Esquimalt Graving Dock that I had heard nothing about until you mentioned it. Well, thanks again for having me, Jack, and thanks for that intro. Now, how am I going to live up to that? You probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, closer to home, for sure. You know, well, Jack, in the, in the spring, just before the last provincial election, I went up to um, uh, Shawnigan Lake where the residents were out there. Uh, there was a furore there. I mean, they were outraged that there was a plan to put in a toxic dump site to take Victoria's toxic waste, but it was situated in the headwaters of Shawnigan Lake. And so the locals there were saying, were saying well, you know, if this leaks or whatever, you know, this is going to pollute the lake and, and the creeks and everything else. You know, they were really uh, upset about this, as you might imagine. Now, this was the South, uh, South Island aggregate site where for years they dug out gravel and stuff for cement mixing. And there's a thing about it, that is mining. And there's a thing about mining in this province where if you dig a hole, when you're finished digging it, you know, you've got to fill it in. Well, these guys were smart and they figured, well, we'll fill it in, but what are we going to fill it in? We'll make money filling it in with toxic waste. Well, this thing, you know, really got hung up, you know. The, um, it was a political hot potato. Everybody swore up and down this would never happen, you know. As I say, this is just before the provincial election. So all politicians up there, everybody was just dead set against this. I didn't think I didn't think this thing had a prayer with and it's a B, the BC Ministry of the Environment has the sign off on it and just like a month ago they they okayed it after all this and uh, you know I still don't know the details up there I'm going to go do another story in Shawnigan but you know the the funny thing is that it leads into something that I found out about that's going on right here in, in just outside of the city uh, there's a place called High West it's a, another toxic uh, receptacle for waste it um, just recently, now it began receiving the contaminated sludge from a dredging project being done at the Esquimalt Graving Docks. Now, what this means is uh, it's a the project is a is a high-rated environmental project, but they're dredging out to make the harbor a bit deeper as well. This sludge is being dewatered down on David Street and then trucked 60 to 90 truckloads. You know these double semis, uh, you know or double uh, tandem uh, dump trucks are going up into the highlands and dumping this just up around uh, Western Speedway there. So um, so 60 to 90, 60 to 90 truck double loads truckloads a day right. of toxic sludge yep. going up to around Western Speedway and being dumped. And does anybody, I mean, I haven't heard a word about it. There, the, the well, there was some coverage of it just in, in late July. There was, uh, there was an error. There was a bit of a boo-boo. And these guys, you know, when you read the literature, it's Trevita is the company that's in charge of this. They're a massive company. They do a lot of stuff with uh, energy and mines and all kinds. What's the name of the, the company? Trevita, uh, Trevita Incorporated. They're, you know, big big company. You know, a geoengineering outfit. And you read their stuff and oh, everything is good. Everyone we use is going to be experienced. Don't worry. There's not going to be a problem. These cells that we put these things into, because there's many cells at this site. These are the where they're going to dump these big pits, basically, right? Uh, lined with high tech material. And and don't worry. This stuff won't leak for well, a little while anyway. But somebody put it in one of the cells that wasn't lined. They, you know, one of these very experienced guys went and they were <laughs> dumping this stuff. Well, it got out that this stuff was, you know, you know, not not protected at all. And this is when it was raining, you know. I mean, so that made the news, and you know, made the TC and the and the Victoria News Group. They they covered it. But you're right. Other than that, it, it's been very hush hush. And the thing with this is, is the people of the Highlands, they didn't find out about it until just weeks before this happened. In May, they found out there was three very hastily organized public uh, information meetings. Uh, almost everybody is on groundwater. You know, they, they, they don't have water services like we do down here in the city, right? So they're worried. And this site is uphill as a crow flies just a few kilometers from Thetis Lake. So if you go like 10 o'clock from Thetis Lake, go up three to you know, in a four kilometers, say, as the crow flies, and, and that's where they are. Well, there's a creek, the Teanook Creek. It com comes right down there into Teanook Lake and then again to Pryor, and, and there's creeks that are all feeding into Thetis, of course, right? So, well, 
you know, they say it's going to be safe and that, you know, everything is going to be done by the book, and that's fine, other than a few mistakes but here wait, and there. But wait, but of course we, it's not going to be safe, and it doesn't matter if it's being done by the book because they write the book. So it's definitely it's not going to be safe. These sites always leak. And, and nobody cares. I mean, that's the game they play. Well, the people up there care. There's some people. Now, I talk to... Uh, I, I talk I mean, nobody to cares in a position of power. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's hard. You know, I, I think... Well, you know, I don't want to be too cynical about this, you know, but, but it's really overwhelming. You know, I, who am I? Just a lay guy, right? I sat down with all the materials, and if you go to the uh, District of Highlands website, which is brand new and still has a few bugs, but they've got a, they've got a pretty, you know, good... Uh, 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 section on this project, you know, lots of materials, and you know, I went through it and was trying to bone up for this show last night. And God, I sat till my eyes went square, you know. And I'm not sure I got any closer to, you know, a real understanding. But it's really intimidating. You go there; these guys are engineers, they're experts, they're experienced. They've done this, you know, for years and years. You know, you're just being an alarmist if you, you know, if you, you know. And it's got to go somewhere. This stuff. We want to get it out of the sea and, you know, make the sea better and so forth and so on, right? But yeah, when you, then you look at some of the things that happen. Well, we just dropped it in the wrong hole. You know, how does that happen? You know, I mean, how? How? You know, and this is you know when the real rain comes. We've had this you know wonderful sunny weather in October here, very unusual for Victoria. But the rain will be coming soon. You know, and and this is what the people there are worried about: the heavy rains, the runoff. The cells aren't completed yet. You know, the cells that are going to receive all of this stuff. So not all of it is being held within the cell boundaries, as I understand it talking to uh, one of the residents up there who, had, you know, Darlene Sanderson got, she went to the Council of Canadians meeting a, uh, a week and a half ago where Maud Barlow was here speaking and uh, Maud gave her the floor to talk about this issue, you know, because of course Maud's very much about water, right? And, you know, they, they, they're really concerned and, and they don't they feel should that there's be been proper con consultation. And there hasn't the been, there never made. is. We're all irrelevant. I just cannot believe that a story this big has been happening. And, you know, I'm an interested citizen. I mean, I, I, I can't believe I just haven't heard about it. You know, I, I just can't believe their ability to keep this stuff secret while they're poisoning everything. Well, it's there for those who look, you know. But the thing is, the kind of news coverage we get, uh, and even the stuff I read, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're writing off of press releases, you know. There wasn't really a lot of probing into, you know, like, what are the knock-on effects of this, you know, a bit deeper into the background? You know, it was pretty superficial, um, and, and that was it, you know, a few hundred words in a, in a couple of local papers, and that's about all I saw. Now, if you go to the, like I say, to the Highland District site, you can read the minutes from the meetings and the presentations and that. You know, I went <laughs> to the, uh, uh, the engineering site, oh my God, you know, and you're, you're trying to understand that. You know, the funny thing is, is that the guys, the engineering outfit, um, uh, Golder Associates. Oh, I know Golder. Yes. Well, Golder did the assessment of the uh, EDG or the Esqu or EGD rather, the Esquimalt Graving Duck Project. But they also have done the uh, assessment of the Highland District water quality. So, mm -hmm. you know, they are asking for a, a third-party, independent, professional um, um, assaying of this whole project and the safety protocols, and especially of the facility at uh, uh, High West there. So again, material, toxic material from a very toxic place, the Esquimalt Graving Docks, is being dredged out and moved to around uh, Western Speedway where it's yeah, leaching into there. people's water supply and into Thetis Lake. Possibly, but you know, we don't know. I mean, they say they're going to test and they're going to watch and there's remediation plans yeah. should the worst happen, you know. I mean, everything, you know, of course, it's all nuclear very power. Reassuring. Nuclear power is safe, according <laughs> to them. Yeah. Well, you know, this is it. We're experts, trust us, you know, yeah. and this is where we are. So, I mean, a very important story. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you wanted to talk a bit about Kevin Nish, who's just back from the well, Middle East. Well, yeah, now Kevin Nish, I don't know, for those people in Victoria who don't know Kevin, this guy is, uh, is a hero by every measure, at least in my book he is, you know. He's a, um, a human rights observer. He's gone to some of the scariest places and, and watched uh, elections in Central America. He's gone into prisons in Colombia where, where union activists uh, are imprisoned on trumped up charges. It's the most dangerous place in the world to be a union member, that in Honduras. Um, he's, you know, he was in El Salvador watching the elections, but more the scariest thing of all, you know, he, he's gone back and back to Gaza and uh, uh, the West Bank and, and been a human rights observer. He's been shot at, he's all kinds of things. And he was on the Mavi Marmara, the ship uh, that on May 31st, 2010, uh, uh, a sensible aid ship trying to break the, the sea embargo of Gaza 
was boarded in international waters by the Israeli uh, occupation force Navy. Uh, and they came in, you know, just right out of the movies, you know, like rappelling down helicopters, guns blazing. Nine of the people on the decks were, were murdered. There were, none of them were armed, although the Israeli military says otherwise. Uh, and Kevin was on that boat. And, and what did he do? Well, I mean, these, like, these are people being shot right at his feet, and he's taking pictures. And not only that, he had the wherewithal to take the memory chip out of his camera and secrete it. So they were all arrested, of course, at least the survivors were. And... Um, all the cameras and everything were thrown overboard and, and taken, you know, but he managed to keep this chip so he has some of the only photographs, evidence that has been used in the, in the court cases in Turkey because these were, it was a Turkish flagged ship and the nine killed were all Turks save uh, one kid, a, a poor 19-year-old chappy who was uh, a Turkish citizen and an American citizen as well, uh, you know, killed in cold blood and, and there was video of that too that came out. But Kevin, anyway, has been in Gaza this last time again, and he says things are really bad there right now, as bad as they've been since the 2008 invasion, uh, because the, the coup, that, or the junta that took over in Egypt, there was a high level of animosity towards Hamas, the, um, the uh, uh, governing party in Gaza. They've made uh, the Rafa uh, crossing, which is the only that's right, the only in really out way out into Gaza is via Egypt. It's so. via Rafa crossing, pretty much, you know, and uh, especially if you're Palestinian, that's the only way. And uh, or, you, know, you could try swim, I suppose. But um, so there has been a very extensive, over these last few years, uh, network of tunnels that have been used to get goods and, uh, in and people in and out f uh, into uh, Egypt and through the Sinai and that. Well, this junta government, uh, and these are the same ones that kidnapped these two Canadians, the... Um, the filmmaker John Grayson and the emergency room physician uh, Dr. Tariq uh, Lubani, uh, who was going to Gaza, they were en route to Gaza actually to do a documentary on Dr. Lubani's work in Gaza, where he teaches emergency physicians trauma uh, uh, procedure. Right. Well, they were there in Egypt when when this big, you know, when it all hit the fan, when the military were putting down a, a big demonstration with deadly force. And here they were, and, and there was people being shot with live ammunition going, help, help, we need a doctor. And this guy said, well, I'm a doctor. Well, they ended up getting arrested by the Egyptians and held for 50-some-odd days. They went on a big hunger strike, and that they're just recently back. But at any rate, you know, Kevin says that you know, while he was there in Gaza, he's been there all, most of this year, you, know, you, you could hear the tunnels being exploded. You know? and, and so they've, they've siphoned off supplies into Gaza, so now it's really down to a trickle. And, and you know people that would get out of Gaza to get medical treatment and so forth, well they're out of luck, and so people are literally dying to get out, uh, you know, at the border. I hadn't really realized that the new Egyptian government was doing that, and that I, I hesitate to call them a government. It's a junta. They took. They took. They, it's a coup, and only the Americans won't. You know, and Canada naturally won't recognize it as such. But there's no other way. Yeah, it, it's an unbelievable what happened there I mean and now my understanding is that the elected de democratically elected Prime Minister Morsi is going to be charged uh, essentially with murder well you know Morsi has a lot to answer for and this is true uh, the way things have been he's been held incommunicado for months and months now I mean it, you know it's outrageous that he was given access to one international observer once as, as far as I'm, I understand just to prove that he was alive if not well you know but yeah they, they plan to try him but this this government has no legitimacy at all and and what little hope the, the secular uh, fans in Egypt had that you know because Morsi you know and the Egyptian Brotherhood they 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 managed to you know upset just about everybody and um, so there's not a lot of sympathy but now they what support the junta had they're losing fast and and there's going to be a, another revolution I, I expect in, uh, in Egypt before too long, and a bloody one at that. And you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, C the CETA, which is the yeah. Canada Well, just one European thing, you know, Council Union Canadian, Trade this is happening as we speak, right. although not as this is being aired, but the CETA agreement is the European Trade Union. We're surrounded by trade unions. There's the TPP to the west, you know, the, C the, uh, uh, the CETA, the CETA with the European Union uh, to the east. You know the plethora of, uh, of investor agreements to the south. You know NAFTA and the, and the rest of it. You know uh, these aren't good for Canada. They're not good for Canadians. They they take away the power um, of our government 
to rule and make laws here. They're superseded to secretive corporate boards who you know don't are not answerable to you and me. That's for certain. And um, it, it's going to make uh, it's going to ruin our labor laws, our environmental laws. You think it's bad now, Jack? You wait. Um, yeah, but anyway, the great takeaway from this is, uh, is uh, Maud Barlow said uh, of the Council of Canadians again. She calls this this is uh, Stephen Harper's Brian Mulroney moment, you know, to sign this. So I mean, this is this is serious, but it's not gone through yet. So Canadians, you know, get out there, you know, get noisy, uh, uh, you know, don't give up your sovereignty that easily. Not like we did with the NAFTA, which has not proven very good for us. But Jack, one last thing though, David Ellis is another guy, and this guy's amazing. I had him on my show a couple weeks ago. Uh, he's all about the uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Pipeline. This is the one that Kinder Morgan wants to twin. Just today, Greenpeace cha ha you know, shackled themselves to this in protest, right? Uh, Wednesday the 18th. So this is the pipeline that runs six into Vancouver. Yes, right. right. Now, it's been there. It's 60-something years old. Well, David is, is goes hiking up and, up and down and just inspecting it because nobody else is, and this thing is in terrible shape. And they want to twin it, but they're still running. Condescent tar sands material is being run down this 60-odd-year-old rickety old pipeline. He predicted there would be a bust up at the Coquihalla. There was. He's predicting many more. He's gone back and he says this thing is going to spring a leak and it's going to be condescent into the Thompson that goes into the Fraser. Bye-bye Fraser sockeye or Fraser salmon. Forget it. So again, this is the kind of uh, media information. I mean, ask me about the Vancouver Canucks. I know every detail, you know. CBC every Saturday, right through hockey season, six hours a night on <laughs> hockey. I mean, I like hockey, so I'm following it. But don't Traitor. any of them, yeah, <laughs> don't any of them have any time to tell us about the important things that are, nobody's ever done like a two hour special on, 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 on this Canada-European Union trade agreement. Well, not that and I'm aware of. It's complicated, you know, it's complicated, Jack, and they don't, they, they think the but it, But simple. it's very simple, but it's really very simple. Here are what we're gonna lose, potentially, you know? People want to know about these things, we just don't. Anyways, Chris Cook, thank you very much. Keep up the great work on Pacific Free Press and on CFUV with Guerrilla Radio and uh, hope to see you on again in about a month's time. Uh, too short again. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.